Are the ladies ready? We are. All right. So, hello, everyone. Welcome to our session, uh, Planetary Health what on, and Humanitarian Action. What on earth is that? Mm -hmm. My name is uh, Dr. Jamila Mahmoud, and I'm the Executive Director of the Summary Center for Planetary Health in Malaysia. Uh, today, uh, we are very proud to host this um, session together with the uh, Mission of Malaysia at the United Nations and International Organizations in Geneva. And with me today are three wonderful uh, panelists. Two of them you see in front of us, but one will be joining us virtually. So let me first introduce our esteemed guest today. Uh, His Excellency, Dr. Dr. Ahmad Faisal bin Mohammed, joining us virtually is the current permanent representative of Malaysia to the United Nations and other international organizations here. And we have known him for such a long time because he has been an esteemed uh, ambassador in some of the most challenging places in the world, uh, including Myanmar. Um, and um, with us uh, online, virtually, you will see Ben Ramalingam, who uh, is the executive director of the UK's Humanitarian Innovation Hub. Ben is a well-known senior leader, strategist, researcher, and author. If you haven't uh, read his books yet, you should. And his first book has really become seminal reading, Aid on the Age of Chaos. And he has also been really the, um, uh, you know, pioneering in innovation and futures and uh, foresight, uh, working with many international organizations. Um, he's a lead author of the Inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change 2012 Report on Extreme Weather Events. And in 2020, he was named a humanitarian change maker of the decade for being one of the most, or one of the 10 people or organizations globally who had done most to improve crisis response work uh, in the 2010s. Uh, with us as well on my immediate right is um, Marvat Shobaya, who is the chief of the Interagency Standing Com Committee Secretariat at OCHA. As you know, the Interagency Standing Committee is such an important secretary that coordinates and works with all the international uh, humanitarian actors and really driving some of the policy changes and, and also action on the ground. Uh, she's a seasoned humanitarian uh, with many years of experience in UN organizations, including OCHA and both the program. But I have had the extreme pleasure of working closely with Mervat. I'm not sure she will say the same about <laughs> the pleasure with me, but uh, she was my deputy at the World Humanitarian Summit Secretary, so welcome, Mervat. Um, and last but not least is uh, my dear friend as well, Dr. Maria Guevara, who is the International Medical Secretary of Médecins Sans Frontières, and she is also a very seasoned medical humanitarian specialist um, with a background in complex humanitarian settings, global health policy and advocacy. But um, she doesn't write it in her CV, but I do know she's actually a pulmonologist. A pulmonologist. So during COVID, I think she was the person you can go to and ask for advice. Um, she's been a member of the advisory group on reform of WHO's work in outbreaks and emergencies uh, with health and humanitarian consequences. She's also been a Safe Steps First Aid Ambassador uh, for a collaborative Pan-Asian program uh, to promote awareness and increasing knowledge of first aid skills. So without further ado, and I also want to just have a special shout out and welcome to our many participants who are joining us on Zoom online. So thank you for being here. Uh, but let's uh, start today with a, um, uh, a welcome address from our esteemed uh, ambassador, um, Dato Faisal, who is joining us on Zoom. So over to you, Dato. Thank you, Nasri. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, and fellow humanitarians, good afternoon. As we emerge from the shadow of the pandemic, doesn't it feel wonderful to be able to gather physical again, physically again and celebrate the best of humanity? So welcome to the first face-to-face -face day, although I'm connecting virtually, of the Humanitarian Networks and Partnerships Week and to Geneva. 
We are indeed very happy that you can be here. And on behalf of the Government of Malaysia, I am delighted to welcome back to Geneva, Tansri Dr. Jamila Mahmoud, or indeed Professor Jamila, following her recent appointment as Executive Director of the Sunway Center for Planetary Health at Sunway University in Malaysia. Perhaps she needs no introduction here. You will recall that she previously served as Under Secretary General for Partnerships with the IFRC as Chief of the World Humanitarian Summit Secretariat, and prior to that as Emergencies Director with UNFPA, as well as earlier founding Mercy Malaysia, one of our foremost NGOs. While she will very ably moderate this panel discussion, I wanted to take a moment before she starts to share a few thoughts with you about why my government was keen to, to co-host this event. Planetary health is perhaps best summed up as a comprehensive approach to addressing the consequences of humanity's impact on planet Earth for a better future. The concept of planetary health was also being iterated by our foreign minister during his speech at the high level segment of the 48th Human Rights Council session, where Malaysia is committed to conserving planetary health as we aspire to achieve a net zero greenhouse gas emission target by 2050. Therefore, co-hosting the event today is in line with Malaysia's commitment on planetary health and will allow us to initiate discussion on this important topic. Addressing what I think we can all agree is now a planetary health crisis requires a stronger focus to improve our political, economic and social systems. Changes must be oriented to better protect us and the Earth's natural systems so that both can thrive. Our 12th Malaysia Development Plan published at the end of 2021, which references planetary health several times, recognizes the need to reframe our development priorities so that they are better harmonized with the, planet of, with the health of the planet. Malaysia is also in the process of de developing a planetary health framework alongside a climate change policy and action plan, both of which Jamila and the Sunway Center are directly involved with. This is because we take the view that to comprehensively address the multidimensional, the multidimensional drivers of crisis, it is not enough to look through a climate lens alone. Regrettably, rapid development over the last few decades has come with a price. We need to adjust our development priorities so that they are more centrally focused on protecting this rich and diverse ecosystem we are lucky to call home. We need to heighten the focus of governments around the world on this very urgent matter and step up global efforts to arrest further environmental degradation and mitigate its negative impacts, including weather-related natural disaster events. Failure to do so will mean leaving behind a sick plan as a legacy to future generations. Befitting the topic of our discussion today, there is a need to recast how we position humanitarian action in this larger planetary health agenda. And here, Jamila and her colleagues will provide us with their thoughts on how this might be best achieved. Dr. Jamila, the floor is, thank you. Okay, so you go to www.menti.com and just use the code 9911376. Just take a couple of minutes for us to, as an icebreaker and just answer yes or no. Wonderful. Nobody has heard about it. Excellent. Oh, 50% have heard about it. Okay, 75%. <laughs> wow. Yeah, we're getting there. It's good. It's good. This is good. We were hoping that more people actually don't know about it so that we can actually talk about it. This is great. Fantastic. 
And then did this for a couple of minutes. How many have responded on the mentor meter? 14. 14. Yeah. Great. Excellent. Keep it going. So roughly about 70%, I would say, have not heard about it, which is great, which is why you're here today. So I think we can agree that it is a fairly new discipline. Um, and uh, we have enough, another question after this. Yeah. So about 70%, 60 to 70% have not heard about it. Thank you for your responses. So can we go to the next question? In your own words, why do you think planetary health matters to humanitarian action? Now you can think about what Ambassador Faisal said and <laughs> reflect upon it and uh, tell us um, why you think it matters. This is just going to create a word cloud. Great stuff. Innovative, resilience, do no harm. Yeah. I like that holistic is coming up really strong. Yeah, resilience, climate change. <clears throat> Biodiversity, good. It's, it's really interesting looking at this uh, word cloud because actually everything that's there is relevant to planetary health. So this is gonna make our life uh, easy uh, this afternoon, easy, yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, so let's go. So let me reflect a little bit uh, about why we're here. Um, as you've heard, I've been a humanitarian for many, many years, uh, working really on the ground as a local and national and regional and then global uh, humanitarian person, and then <clears throat> moving into much more strategic policy stuff. And then COVID happened, and I got, I went home, and I was roped into COVID response uh, with the government, and then sort of suddenly had that moment where all the years we've been doing humanitarian work, we didn't really think about the planet, did we? And yet COVID, didn't come out of the blue. It came out because we, as human beings, have actually done a lot of damage. The choices we make, the so-called in the name of development, has actually caused a lot of environmental destruction, has caused a lot of the, uh, you know, the way we plan, the way we build, the way we develop, the way we consume, uh, is just so driven by us, humanity. And it was so easy to sort of separate COVID from everything else happening in the world. But that's not how the world functions, whether it's COVID or a, a disaster arising from the climate crisis or conflict response. You know, the response generally is the same. There are vulnerable people, we need to meet their needs. And we talk about resilience, about bouncing back. But how many of them actually bounce back? So all this, you know, got me to think about, you know, that perspective, the impact that COVID had was like any other humanitarian crisis. We are out there to try and save lives. The economy was affected, social disruption from education to gender-based violence, um, to the way the social fabric uh, continues, mental health issues everything that we have seen in the humanitarian sector. And of course, the livelihood impact was so immense that people are still struggling till today and has pushed many countries into, or many people into abject poverty. The colliding threats, whether it is health and other crises are apparent. And yet we work continually in our little sectors and we have our own ways of communicating our own language that we use in the humanitarian sector and then we don't see things as a, as a whole. It, but the, the underlying thing for me was that at the end of the day it's about people and that people have vulnerabilities and whether it's to a health crisis or other crisis the vulnerabilities remain the same and in fact become enhanced. So in 2015 the Lancet Commission 
um, and Rockefeller Center worked together and they came up with the Commission on Planetary Health. And, and thus the discipline, so to speak, of uh, planetary health uh, emerged. And of course, there's many things that we think about, you know, what is this? Is it one health? Is it animal health? What is it? People have been talking about different aspects of health, but actually it's very different, I would say. And if you go to the one slide, uh, I'm just gonna show you two slides because I think it's important we start with the right basics. So in summary, Planetary health is a solutions-oriented transdisciplinary field and a social movement focused on analyzing and addressing the impacts of human disruptions to Earth's natural systems on human health and all life on Earth. And we have seen that without human health thriving, nothing else works. So you can't even get to deliver a humanitarian response in Yemen or Syria the international response system sort of rolled to a halt because of boundary closures and the whole dialogue around localization, everything played out, right? So the interlinkages between planetary health and our humanitarian sector is so clear and yet so difficult to imagine. So there is no doubt our global environment is changing from the hottest years on records that we're seeing right now in India and the rest of the world um, to the disappearance of pollinators. And I was so happy walking around Geneva. I only left two years ago, but they've allowed the wildflowers to, to grow and you can actually see insects and bees, which is wonderful, to the global collapse of fisheries. And now, you know, with clear evidence that microplastics are in our blood, in our fish and in children's and babies' feces, and to use, and to our use of about half of the planet's livable surface to feed ourselves. And now, in this new geological era, I've mentioned the word the Anthropocene, characterized by humanity's dramatic impact on Earth's natural systems. And even though our average global health status has actually improved in the past century the health of our planet has simply declined, putting historically recent and fragile public health gains at risk. So we're not only faced with climate change, we're also affected by declining biodiversity, shortages of arable land, fresh water, pollution, changing biogeochemical flows. And all these have direct risks and direct links to some of the crises we're facing. Go to Africa now with the desertification, lack of arable land, you know, poverty ensues. Ukrainian conflict right now, driving food prices up in, a, in an environment where we have lack of water and an increasingly uh, hot world. So everything is affected and the changes to natural life support systems are already impacting us on our daily lives. And, you know, if you look at disease and health, it's always easy to imagine that health lives within the health complex, but actually only 20% of health is actually contributed from the health complex. 80% is environmental, social, behavioral, and only a 5% genetic. So bottom line is everything is connected. And that, you know, what we do to the world today comes back to hurt us. And I had that moment after 20 over years in the sector thinking to myself, did I contribute to all the crises that are actually happening in the world today? Was the way we responded just not the right way that we actually hurt ourselves and hurt the world and hurt other people as well? So I'm gonna show a very recent snapshot of The Guardian. And you'd think, you know, with all the IPCC reports and COP26 and all the dialogues, that people will change, but it's not happening. This is from The Guardian just very recently on May 7th, where Brazil's uh, Amazon deforestation hit uh, hits April high, nearly double the previous peak. You'd think that we would have some sense to start acting on it. You'd think governments, you'd think citizens would be outraged with the global world. And that, you know, to imagine now what's going to happen when you have no arable land in Brazil. And we need one and a half Brazils to feed the rest of the world today, uh, to, or to grow enough food for the rest of the world. So 
Today, what we hope to do is really try to examine this. How do we do better? How do we, as a humanitarian sector, try to look at things in a much more holistic way, a much more transdisciplinary way? How do we connect the social, economic, political, humanitarian, human rights issues uh, that will actually drive that change because we, the human beings and humanity is actually driving the crisis. So um, we will have that opportunity to, through our three panelists, to start discussing about this. And I should mention that, first of all, we are very grateful that this HNPW this year has started to demonstrate that change is possible. One, you have a hybrid event. So people like me, maybe in future, do not need to fly all over the world to get to connect with all of you and get to know each other and work together and collaborate. Secondly, that we are celebrating the climate charter that has been signed and that the ISC has been very actively championing. And that, you know, the question then comes to mind is that, yes, it's great, but do we risk creating another silo with the climate charter alone? Already we have the humanitarian development, peace, nexus, and the climate charter. What next? Shouldn't the planetary health approach be that overarching approach for us to start looking at the problems we face and how we solve them? So without further ado, I will then start turning to the panelists who will give us all the answers that we need to know and the solutions <laughs> that we, we, we need to uh, find. Um, and I will turn first to Maria, the hardcore humanitarian MSF organization that we all admire. But MSF has actually embraced planetary health before any other humanitarian organization in its, uh, in its humanitarian work. And the approach uh, calls for everyone to engage and work together. And initially, you know, the Planetary Health Center, by the way, was born out of my dining room uh, just before the lockdown. And Maria and my colleague Lorenzo sat, sat together over, you know, I had to cook them a big heavy dinner so they couldn't go back. <laughs> and, and we said, you know, we need this, right? We need to build a center that will try and rethink future solutions. And, um, and the rest is history. At the time when I was introduced to him, planetary health, you know, after the Lancet Commission and so forth, I was just trying to think how on earth would MSF embrace this? So Maria, how come MSF <laughs> took this on uh, full, full, full on, right? Why did they make these choices? And, you know, maybe share a little bit of the journey because I know you've been involved with it from the start. And then, you know, what does MSF need to do to translate that thinking and the embrace, embracing the planetary health uh, approach into operations, into policy, into advocacy? Because I can see MSF, the hardcore white red t-shirts, right? Wanting to go out there and do it, now having to take a step back and think about their impact. Yeah, big question of the decade. <laughs> um, so first, thanks to Jamila. Um, and also wanted to say thank you to the Permanent Mission of Malaysia to the UN with Dr. Faisal and the Sunway Center for hosting um, this um, panel discussion on the two topics that I am quite passionate about, which are planetary health and humanitarian action. And it is, it is a, it's a very interesting combination, but I think one that is most relevant. But first, you know, I mean, MSF is humanitarian organization. We are of the denantist ethos of impartiality, um, neutrality, and independence. But we're also quite a medical organization of beneficence, led by um, medical ethics of beneficence, non-maleficence, which is a do no harm, and autonomy and justice. It's probably very relevant today for us to be talking about the future scenarios um, because we're hitting, well, we're 50 years old as an organization, and we are actually reflecting inside um, what would be the next 50. Who do we want to be? What do we want to answer to? What should we be doing? And um, at the core, though, we're still an emergency organization. We're still here to save lives, alleviate suffering, promote dignity for all humanity, especially the most vulnerable. And probably this is where the core of why it makes sense to frame around planetary health. As many of you may have read already the IPCC 6 report, basic that came out, and we know Ben was part of that, but 10 years later in their 6th report, their verdict is really, really grim. So basically they're saying 
that we are one, that there is no doubt <laughs> that our planet and life system is heating up and it's our fault. We humans are responsible. That two, that perhaps there's little hope remaining to avoid the worst case scenario. This is an emergency and the effects will be mostly overwhelmingly negative for the most vulnerable. So in, in fact, the impact is disproportionately today felt in the humanitarian hotspots by the most vulnerable. And those climate hotspots are the humanitarian hotspots today. And um, unfortunately, they remain the blind spots for the rest of the world. And what's the problem with climate change is it's very invisible. It's in the air. You see it. It's pumping out through our cars, through the falls, to the factories, et cetera. And you don't see it. And this is why the planetary health makes sense because it talks about the different planetary boundaries of biodiversity loss, of food insecurity, of water insecurity, deforestation, extractive industries, which is where we and the staff are seeing it directly in our face. That's causing the direct diseases that we're seeing. Um, and you know, the emerging infectious diseases, for example, with the deforestation um, and the conflict that we're impacted because of the resource curse. Um, all those are already it's well identified in planetary health, framing of planetary boundaries. But what's really important is, and one of the things that I've been reflecting on, and this is why I kept putting it on the table for Jamila's table, but also on the table of MSF, is when I was, I'm a pulmonary and critical care doctor, and um, after 18 years of working with MSF, the first half, I started to get out of the more clinical and really look at global health. And I took a master's degree on global health policy. And in my face was planetary health, just as when it was coming out. And I sat there and read it and I saw humanity. Why am I saving humanity when we are the cause? And it, it was just a no brainer to me that we needed to answer to that. We needed to own our responsibility and understand that the impacts to the most vulnerable. And this is how it came about, why that was important, because it is, it is our fault. And we need to take and own that responsibility and act on it now because emergency is today and it's not tomorrow. Maybe, I mean, I will end there. I, can, I know it's a conversation, but I can continue on. No, I'm gonna ask time. you more now, Maria. Okay. So, so you, you, <laughs> you took the bull by the horn in a, a very, I would say, conservative yet radical organization as MSF is known for. And, uh, you know, you must have faced some challenges, right? Getting traction and, you know, after all, everyone's talking about climate and the environment and, the, and all that. Are we asking for too much to be talking about planetary health? I don't, well, first, I don't think it's too much. I think it's the right framing just to come back. So for MSF, it's not the first time we've been handling or dealing with environmental dis disasters. I mean, if you go way back in the Aral Sea in the 1990s, um, we <coughs> opened projects around the Aral Sea because we knew that was already um, decreasing over what, um, by 75 to 90% over three, four decades. And if you've probably seen the BBC. And at that time, we already said in 1998, we put on our website on Earth Day, which was the International Year of Oceans, that this is an environmental disaster. Then we started to look at climate change, but it seemed so far from us as, a, as, a, as an entity. And many in MSF still today ask, but why? We're already doing emergencies. What do we need to do differently? But that's the question. It's not, it's, it's what is it that we will need to change? And what is it exactly that we, we are not seeing? And I think it's, it's this invisibility seemingly so. And the idea is not to change everything, but actually put on that lens of climate and environment and planetary health and do things smarter, just much be more climate smart. But it's also because it's our social responsibility to do no harm according to the, our medical ethics. Why would we leave a, an environmental disaster? We save lives and then we go away. And then what we have we created a whole waste and more pollution. It's in, unconscionable to actually think of it this way. And we also have a mandate to speak out, to bear witness. And patients are telling us, and even our local, our local staff are telling us, we're seeing things we've not seen before. 
we have to listen, we have to hear. So operationally though for MSF, the way we're looking at it is operational adaptation, environmental and footprint mitigation, and advocacy. So basically, what does that mean? Well, first and foremost, our mitigation is the first step. And that's how we bought in the organization is this do no harm principle. We really took that on as a social responsibility. And institutionally, we made the commitment last December as an institution that we will cut our, our carbon emissions by half by 2030 compared to our 2019 levels. If you know MSF, we're 45 to 50,000 staff globally and with all over in over 70 countries. So to commit to national, uh, internationally and globally to this is important. Um, and to help us, we've signed up to the Climate Charter and we're working with others, including Healthcare Without Harm. Our Climate Smart teams are working with Climate Action Accelerator to help us identify where those low hanging fruits in the biggest bang. And that's usually in supply, in forecasting, because while we're not necessarily um, producing necessarily things, we are huge cons consumers and we need to be very cognizant of that in our behavior. Yeah. But the second on operation is the adaptation. It's being smarter. How are we analyzing context? How are we looking at not only a geopolitical and the social cultural and the health, but actually the environment and the implications of that? We're trying to work with others on developing tools that really anticipatory because it's it's going to be more complex. It's going to be more compounded. Emergencies are, and we need to be smarter. We need to target the most vulnerable, and this helps us to do that. And we're working with organizations like Health in Harmony, which is actually the first planetary health organization um, in practice today. Um, researchers like Chris Golden from Harvard, who's nutrition planetary health, working in Madagascar. So we're, we're partnering with people to really be smarter about how we anticipate going forward. And then we're adding our voice and giving the platform for those who are most affected and putting that on the table. Great, thanks a lot, Maria. I'm gonna to turn to Ben. <clears throat> ben, I remember many conversations we've had and the fascinating subject of the nexus, right? All of us who've been long enough in this sector, we've heard of the humanitarian development nexus and then came in the peace nexus and now climate and environment. Now, my view is that perhaps taking a planetary health approach uh, to this would have provided us a different and less siloed uh, platform. Is this being oversimplistic and um, optimistic? Thanks, Jamila. Uh, and actually, I think, first of all, that there's, there's a bit of two-way learning that can happen here. I think there are things that the embryonic planetary health movement in the humanitarian sector can learn from the ongoing effort on the nexus. And also at the same time, things that the nexus can learn from planetary health work. In fact, there's actually a new OECD review, an interim report on progress on the nexus from multilaterals and bilaterals coming out tomorrow. And I think there'll be some really useful insights there. But what we already know about the nexus is that it's the long-term cultural, political, and economic process that a country goes through, which influences governments and local actors' decisions about their humanitarian peace development responses to crises, and that enable them to put their citizens' needs and interests and capabilities first, and are actually at the heart of effective nexus efforts. And international actors can be a support for, but they can never substitute for that process, not really, not fully. And I think that the, the real challenge for planetary health is that we need to work to generate and seize these substantive opportunities that are generated by the planetary health lens to understand the vulnerabilities. But ultimately it comes down to convincing and working with national actors, with local stakeholders and communities to support them to deal with the intertwining health, humanitarian and environmental crises. And ultimately it comes down to being able to allocate resources in a way to deal with current and future health needs of affected populations. As Maria already said, it's the most vulnerable that are going to be disproportionately affected. And, th and that's a transformation that's needed. And humanitarians need to support that in close collaboration with development and environmental and public health colleagues. And so from a planetary health perspective, I think this means being very clear about what the entry point of the humanitarian sector is in terms of three things, you know, emergency response in terms of meeting 
immediate needs, recovery in terms of feeding in, and feeding into longer term development, risk reduction and resilience and advocacy and bearing, bearing witness and doing all of this in ways which are complementary and coherent with medium term and not longer term objectives. But in terms of what it actually brings, I think there is a risk to better. I think uh, the planetary health lens widens, deepens and lengthens the nexus. It widens it in that it brings in more considerations. It deepens it in that it means that we have to look much more fully at the underlying causes of crises and not just the, the symptoms. And it lengthens it in, in that we need to take a longer term view, uh, even then in development to our thinking in terms of the longer term projections of climate change and environmental degradation. So there is a risk that the sector gets overwhelmed by getting even greater demands placed on it. But at the very same time, there's a really urgent need to take this lens because as Marie has already made clear, planetary health is a global emergency of the kind we have not seen before. And the whole world needs to be on a crisis footing. And it's really clear already that a planetary health approach has been used to improve our understanding and communication around the nexus between COVID pandemic and its environmental, its cultural, its social, its racial, its ethnic, its financial roots. And what we've seen so clearly from COVID is planetary health disasters like MSF, they know no borders. They not only devastate human lives and goods and infrastructures, but they slow down and reverse the achievement of the SDGs and they fundamentally affect countries' development outcomes. And so I think we have to see planetary health as an integrated approach that can bring more coherence to humanitarian policies and practices and offers a chance to shift not just humanitarian cooperation, but international cooperation as a whole in terms of combining our efforts in interventions and human resources and budgets and enhanced synergies across what are currently very multiple fragmented agendas. I can't, I can't hear. Um, you've been in the policy world for such a long time. been in the policy world for such a long Hello, I'm talking to myself. Hello, yeah. Hello. I'm talking to myself. Yeah. Yeah. I can hear now. Go ahead, Jimena. Then you have to uh, mute yourself. Good. All right. Um, I think we share the view that um, humanitarian policy has never been so challenged by the myriad of issues that the system faces. I mean, it's one after another, right? Is there energy and bandwidth to consider what is a step change proposal and how? What is your advice to us? And, and how do we get there? What role can the current humanitarian architecture play in that sense? Thanks, Julia. I think... I know we've already talked about the importance of shared objectives across international frameworks, and we've talked about the need to protect the most vulnerable for planetary health and counteract the fragmentation of global efforts. But planetary health needs to move, if it's going to be taken seriously in the humanitarian sector, we need to move beyond integrated and systemic frameworks. That, that cannot be the, the solution to the most pressing issue of our time. What we need are clear collective statements of intent around what is good and what is not good planetary health policy and practice. And this means getting genuinely operationalized these concepts in the, in the constellation of acts involved in crisis response. And it also means getting enforcement mechanisms, clear guidance and monitoring evaluation and, and dedicated governance efforts. So for a policy perspective, I think there are four concrete things and actually, I'm echoing here some of the things that Maria has already said, but they build on things that we've already uh, have some expertise and skill in. Now, Maria talked about first do no harm. I think we need to apply this principle at a global level. The Lancet Commission on Planetary Health that you talked about previously, Jimena, said that we have been mortgaging the well being of our current and future generations to realize economic and development gains. And not only do we need to start paying off that mortgage early and quickly, but it also means it's not doing those new things, uh, new things, but stopping and ending those practices that underpin planetary ill health. So this means, for example, supporting the integration of humanitarian needs such as food insecurity, 
nutrition, gender, into environmental impact assessments, making sure that humanitarian considerations are built into environmental and social assessments, and making sure that we're not causing damage with one part of the international cooperation system, namely development, that the humanitarian system is trying to fix. I think bearing witness is another important issue that Maria raised, and that, that's not just a what is, but what might be. And I think planetary health lens enables us to focus on the needs of the populations we currently serve to reveal the overlapping ways in which people might be vulnerable. And this, this includes the inequitable distribution of environmental degradation, which drives health inequities and drives humanitarian needs. We already know that the people who are poorest and have the least political power are most exposed to waste and pollution. We know that indigenous populations are hit hardest by biodiversity loss, and we know that women are disproportionately impacted by things like indoor air pollution. But that's not just within countries, but we're also seeing those inequities between countries where the risks and the burdens are not shared. Uh, and so I think there's a huge humanitarian advocacy role here, not just for stating what the current challenges are, but for anticipating these risks and advocating for them to be addressed. And this means being much clearer about the multiple systemic causes of crisis, so that we're not just dealing with the symptoms of the climate health nexus, but also the causes. And I think we need better multi-sectoral policies that cut across environment, health, economic development, and humanitarian, whilst being rooted in the rights and the needs of the most vulnerable. This means within the humanitarian sector, you know, use of energy sources, green humanitarian action, but also wider actors, getting better links between climate data, crisis data, and epidemiological surveillance, and building national and local capacities to anticipate and respond to the new and emerging planetary health threats that are happening. I think the final thing that we need to be doing is building resilience and foresight and systemic approaches in health systems, both existing routine health systems and health humanitarian health systems. And this means addressing xenotic and waterborne diseases from an environmental lens so you get better anticipation. It means putting climate risks and disaster resilience into health practices. It means the sustainable procurement of energy in the health sector, solar hospitals and clinics that improve not just the quality of basic services, but also their sustainability. Sorry, my, I was muted, sorry. I think what you, you hit on was, you know, what we need to do is have some pragmatic approaches on how you take that planetary health framework into operations. It's not about reinventing the wheel, right? It's about really uh, taking that, you know, that view and trying to bring it all together. I think that's one thing. The other thing, of course, is that I was very struck by um, a book that I read, if you haven't, uh, it's called The Good Ancestor, about how is it that we are able to always be so short term in our thinking, in our actions, in humanitarian response particularly, and not have time to take a step back and have a bit of a long-term thinking. And this is something more that you will remember uh, from the World Humanitarian Summit, where we actually discuss, you know, can we even have a risk sort of special entity in the UN that actually anticipates risk uh, and also looks at foresight and you know, bring that into, into the, the sector thinking. Uh, and, you know, then, you know, the tools that you need to create will be very new tools, tools that don't exist today. And I think that takes, you know, a lot of thinking and, you know, and this is why you're here with us today, Mervat. Mm -hmm. uh, Mervat is very brave to join us today uh, because, you know, we, a lot rests on her shoulders. She has a really tough job. Um, uh, a lot of what we heard today is uh, Lay's responsibility to act, act at the feet of the IAC because that is the highest level poly policy making body uh, as you know um, during the GA resolution 46182 it was created to, to do that and um, you're already deluged with calls for action but given that climate change has made it into IAC's strategic agenda for 2022-23 what we really want to hear is your advice and how you can help us think through what might be a practical way for us to engage with the IESC, maybe for, for a start, if you can uh, uh, help us with that. Happy to. And Jamila, thanks again uh, for bringing us all together and really to Ambassador Faisal 
as well as the Sunway um, uh, Center, um, um, really important topic. And I think one of the biggest pluses for, at least for me, from where I sit in the ISC is that this is a really huge awareness raising session because uh, prior to speaking to you, Jamila, I'll confess, I have not myself personally been exposed to the topic of uh, planetary health, but obvious how uh, important it is and how critical it is uh, for all of us as human beings and as, uh, you know, being part of this uh, beautiful earth of ours and at the same time also in terms of what we're doing to uh, support the most vulnerable um, around uh, uh, the world the world so and always great Maria to see you and it's been a while since we actually saw you in person so I agree with you Ambassador Faisal it's lovely to be here in person with colleagues and sorry to be missing you and, and Ben uh, uh, as well. Um, so um, Jamila, I can't say it's really bravery uh, to, to be here. I think um, for two reasons. Um, one is because I think it's critical for us and especially also the ISC to be humble. I mean, we are one tranche, uh, one contributor to humanitarian action and really where it really matters and where the rubber hits the road is really frontline responders, communities, uh, governments, regional organizations, and I hope we practice what we uh, believe in, which is the UN and the IC should be really a provider of last resort, but we do have a critical contribution to make. So that's why I, I, I approach it with a sense of humility that we are one contributor and one critical stakeholder, but we're not um, uh, the only ones, of course, out there on the contrary. Our role should be more of a support uh, role. And also um, 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 because uh, the spirit of the ISC, and this is something that we've really been pushing for over the last couple of years, is uh, the importance of dialogue and debate and um, um, uh, uh, not just with us as the ISC members, which is largely UN, the, you know, the key UN agencies and some of the largest international NGOs, ICRC and IFRC, but critically that there are of course, there's a world outside of the ISC that we need to be engaging with. And that's, you know, that's why I'm happy to be here to hear and learn and see how, uh, what are the opportunities for us to collaborate with the brilliant brains and, and knowledge that exists beyond the ISC to, to inform um, uh, the work of the ISC in support of, of course, communities and governments um, uh, on the ground. So um, um, as you pointed out, Jamila, um, it should not, of course, come as a surprise that climate um, has uh, is, is a priority for the Interagency Standing Committee. And for colleagues that are not aware with the, the Interagency Standing Committee, this is a General Assembly mandated body. It was created in 1991 by all member states of the United Nations to coordinate humanitarian action. That's not just policy, that's also operations. So the Emergency Relief Coordinator, on behalf of the Secretary General, he is charged with coordinating the ISC members' efforts to prepare for and respond to humanitarian crises around the world, whether it's Afghanistan or Ukraine or the COVID. And a critical aspect of that, of course, is the policy and the normative work that we do, but also critically, as you mentioned, Maria, in, in, in MSF is the advocacy aspect as well. So there are fundamentally three pillars, and the bottom line is really about saving lives and reducing um, the suffering. Um, so, um, so, of course, it does not come, come as a surprise that addressing the climate, uh, uh, our role as the IFC and as humanitarians in um, uh, mitigating the impact of the climate crisis on the most vulnerable around the world naturally is a, is a, is a high priority for the Interagency Standing Committee. Um, and again, similar to MSF, there are quite a few ISC members that have also signed up to the climate charter, which we're of course, um, uh, of course, pleased about. But again, um, it's about, of course, translating a lot of these great commitments to action, and that's why, again, I'm happy that that we're having this conversation today. Very shortly, uh, OCHA, the Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, will be issuing a report around humanitarian action and the climate crisis. Um, and some of the, 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 the data and the evidence there, similar to what we've seen also over the last decades, is uh, quite sobering. Um, but again, to reiterate, to reiterate, of course, that climate, the climate crisis is a humanitarian crisis, that uh, this is a crisis that we're facing now. It's not something that we'll be facing in 2030 or 2050. This is a crisis that we're facing today. Um, and third, that this is not just another challenge or another issue that we have to face as a humanitarian community, but this is actually an existential issue for tens of millions of vulnerable people around the world. So this is not uh, you know, a, 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 a footnote, let's say, but it's a critical issue because it's about 
um, uh, life-saving and, uh, and, and reducing suffering for, 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 for real. Um, at the same time, it also speaks to, again, what Ben and um, Jamila, you've mentioned, and Asr Faisal and Maria have, have mentioned around the climate crisis really compounding um, uh, um, and increasing humanitarian needs on the ground and really adding layers of complexity to communities that are already vulnerable. Yeah. Um, but the challenge is also that we're seeing with the climate crisis is that we're seeing that it's not just affecting countries where we have humanitarian operations, where there are humanitarian needs, it's also spilling into other countries, middle income countries and beyond. Uh, so we have a responsibility to make sure that we are better partnering with critical stakeholders to understand the size of the problem, where these challenges, humanitarian crises will emerge, so we're in a better position to prepare and respond. Uh, but at the same time, the, the underlying message in all of this is that this is a huge this is a huge issue and a huge problem that cannot be tackled alone by humanitarians and that's why ben what you mentioned really resonated very very strongly um, with me and i'm sure with many of the members of the isc is that uh, we need to engage and we need to partner with um, critical uh, actors that have a critical contribution to this uh, discourse um, number one, of course, we spoke about uh, communities affected by crisis. Second, of course, is governments whose primary responsibility is to respond to the needs of their population. Third, of course, are development actors. And I would hope that in the next, of course, uh, discussion will have perhaps DCO yes. or UNDP or IFRC, of course, that is doing amazing work on, 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 on addressing the climate uh, uh, issues on the ground. And they were really the advocates and they really pushed really hard to issue the IAC statement as, as well as also to encourage IAC members to sign the, the, the charter. So it's really important that IFIs and uh, the World Bank, who also has critical evidence and data that we need to um, uh, benefit from. So um, I, I think that, again, the, the message here is inclusion, as you were mentioning, as it is a holistic issue that needs to be addressed in a holistic manner. We need to make sure that um, we don't repeat what we always do within mm. the sector, which yeah. is we speak to ourselves. And mm. I think we speak to ourselves and we, you know, uh, you know, we're, we're aware of what the issues are, but it's, it's, uh, we need the other key stakeholders to be at the table to work hand in hand with us to make sure that we're able to address the repercussions and the impact of the climate yeah. crisis that we're all feeling um, together. Otherwise, uh, it will be extremely uh, challenging. Um, I think um, there's there's a lot more to say, but if, if, I, if I may, I know Jamila, my no, time no, is probably up. So um, to give you an example also in terms, in, their, in terms of statistics, in 2020, the 12 countries most vulnerable to, the, to climate change and are, and are receiving humanitarian assistance all were in a state of conflict or high social fragility yeah. um, and had concurrent public health emergencies due to yeah. COVID. Again, as you all know, because of COVID, all the attention was around responding to the COVID crisis, which implied that for many of the um, vulnerable countries and fragile countries, because of the limited capacities and resources, they diverted their attention from responding to other health emergencies that are existing in the country, whether it's tuberculosis or malaria or cholera, yeah. because the capacities were so stretched and they had to divert it to do their best to respond to, to, to COVID. Uh, but again, it speaks again to the compounded nature of this uh, problem. And that's why I really like how it's framed under the umbrella of, of planetary health. And it really speaks to first that, you know, we are struggling. This is an ailing planet. And I do agree with you. We all have a contribution uh, in how ailing it is. And the second point is uh, the importance of addressing the root causes of why we are in the state that we're in right now. And again, Ben, what you were mentioning resonates very, very strongly to me. It's not only treating the symptoms because as humanitarians, we're always addressing the symptoms. Yeah. And we have to also be humble as in terms of humanitarians and our, um, uh, uh, our capacities and the resources that we, that are, uh, that we, we, we have to uh, know um, how much we can contribute and who else do we need to engage with to make sure that we address the root causes that are causing these compounded uh, vulnerabilities on, um, on, on communities uh, uh, on the ground. Um, that this is a concerted effort. We have to do it uh, together uh, for sure. And just to give you an example, for the global humanitarian overview, this is the annual um, uh, report that is issued on behalf of the ISC that gives a projection of the humanitarian needs in uh, various in the crises around the world and what is um, uh, what is needed in terms of financial contributions to respond 
to the most vulnerable um, uh, around the world that are suffering from humanitarian crisis or humanitarian uh, disasters. Last year, uh, uh, the dollar ask was $37 billion. And this was a, an increased amount because of COVID. Prior to that, I think it was around 20 billion, if I'm not mm. mistaken. And out of the 37 billion, we were able to raise $18 billion. If my if my if my figures are correct, the, on for ODA for the development assistance, we're talking about a a, a significant and sizable envelope of over 180 billion dollars. And then for climate, this is even um, I, I don't have the figures honestly on, on my fingertips, but it's we're talking about a much bigger. Uh, um, uh, 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 resources that are available for climate mitigation and adaptation that we need to be able to capitalize on um, and work jointly to, to make sure that we, have, we address the overlaying of, 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 of um, uh, challenges that are confronting humanitarian and humanitarian crises. I'll stop here, Jamila. Yeah, and, uh, fantastic. Marvat. So I'm going to ask you another question. How can we get this to the attention of the ERC? Of the ISC members, you know, we've, we've, I'm sure we all realize now, you know, with this Planetary Health 101, by the way, thank you for sitting in the COP with me uh, in March, you know, and I didn't know I had COVID, I was talking to her all the time. Uh, and thank you, thankfully, you are well. Um, and, uh, you know, how do we get this to in front of people when they have Ukraine on their mind, when they have mm -hmm. Yemen on their mind? And, this is, and yet we know the cost of this is so much higher. Mm -hmm. The cost of climate crisis is so much higher than you know, not to, not to, to belittle uh, conflict, but they're all important. But how do we, in an attention span that is really quite limited now, you know, what would be your personal kind of reflection? How we we should aim in terms of ambition uh, to ad advance and shape the argument. Mm. So um, uh, I think we have a number of opportunities, one mm -hmm. of which is uh, the upcoming COP, uh, and I think the ISC is uh, slowly but surely rallying to prepare for the COP in terms of going beyond the statement, but also laying out what it is concretely that uh, we will be doing as, uh, uh, as, uh, as a system. Uh, I think linked to this as well as uh, given the fact that climate is featuring as a priority for the ISC and for the ISC uh, principles. So this is obviously an issue that will remain high on the agenda of the ISC for the next couple of years, and I'm sure beyond, because uh, fortunately the, this challenge won't go away after, after a couple of years. So the wind of opportunity are, is really in terms of capitalizing on um, uh, natural champions within the system that are doing quite a bit of work uh, within the ISC on, on climate. And I already mentioned the IFRC, but there are many that are doing amazing yeah. work. Um, so identifying these, and I'm happy, of course, to, to work with colleagues to, to do so. And I hope there are a number of ISC members uh, in the room. And I would love to, of course, hear yeah. your views on how you can champion plan yeah. planetary health within, within the ISC. Um, uh, but again, maybe echoing, Ben, the point, um, and Jamila, your points that you raised, which is, uh, it's about unpacking, you know, the issue and making it as relevant as possible, mm -hmm. uh, with also a sense of humility that uh, we are one contributor and there are larger, of course, constituents that we need to be engaging with. So how can we make sure that this we unpack this problem concretely so that it's, I understand the importance, of course, normative work, but at the same time, as, as you've mentioned, it's about operations. So how can it be uh, unpacked in a way that it is um, uh, meaningful and uh, comprehensible for the colleagues that are on the ground that are working with governments and communities um, uh, to 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 address this uh, this uh, you know situation. Um, and I think the other part is more of these dialogues and more of these debates. Um, we're already within the ISC. Of course, the World Bank is one of the key uh, members. <laughs> And we will be capitalizing on the World Bank, I would hope, inshallah, for them to share more uh, regularly analysis and the data around how the climate crisis is impacting various countries, fragile and beyond, yeah. so that we can better prepare and respond. But yeah. there are definitely opportunities. So, um, so what we are proposing, and we hope this could be an outcome of our session today, is that maybe we need a small group to come together and start looking um, at, you know, some kind of policy thinking, a little working group to think about the planetary health humanitarian interface. I think, and then bring that to you, right? To say that to the ISC that you know, here are some of the ideas we might have. 
Um, <clears throat> and, uh, and more radically, should we consider renaming the Climate Change and Environment AOCC uh, to Planetary Health Crisis AOCC? Because surely it's broader than just the, the climate uh, change and environment area of concern, right? Mm. Your thoughts? Um, um, it, it's an interesting question about changing the, the, the name. I, <laughs> uh, but you know yeah, me well, right? I know, I know, I know. <laughs> so it's, uh, yeah, I mean, everything is, uh, it's, it's, it's open for, for, for consideration. Um, you know, ultimately, honestly, for me, it's about just, you know, practically how, um, how is all of this going to translate to changes on the ground? Yeah. The reason I say this is because we work super closely, of course, with resident uh, and humanitarian coordinators on yeah. the ground who are leading the UN and the IC's response in the field. And I meet with them regularly. And, uh, and just even those that are just looking at the humanitarian arm, there's considerable um, uh, pressures on them to address mental health and psychosocial support, mm. protection, gender <clears throat> equality, uh, localization, AP, a, a whole gamut of issues. Um, and then when you expand it also to look at the development arm and the expectations from them, and then when you expand it to look at the political arm, especially for the deputy um, uh, yes, special representatives of the Secretary General, it is considerable. So um, if we want to bring in the planetary, planetary health component, it has to feature and has to be built into um, uh, the frameworks and the, the the, the tools that already exist, because if it's creating another tool, it will be looked at as, a, as, a, as an additional task. Yeah. So how do we um, make it as um, accessible as possible for, for the colleagues on the ground, yeah. um, uh, number one. And uh, number two, um, I think linked to this is the starting point, I really fundamentally believe in this is really with robust and strong analysis. Yeah really robust and strong analysis. We're yeah. trying to do this, of course, with on the development front, yeah. engaging with development actors. I think we're slowly getting better uh, engaging with climate actors, but yeah. again, um, it needs to be a lot wider and more holistic to look at planetary health as well. Yeah, I think our narrative has to be super clear. Our tools have to be simple and integrated and make sense. Uh, but I think the last point is the evidence base, right? And why it's so important. I think that's very important. Now, I've been looking at Facebook Live because we're on Facebook Live and lots of questions coming in. Great questions, by the way. Thank you to our very engaged audience. Um, so I'm going to ask uh, the panel some of these questions. And please, for those here, please raise your, uh, your hand if you have any questions for the panel. But um, I'm going to start by saying a couple of things. Thank you, Hung Wai Pin, for so many wonderful comments. And where he says, planetary health is a key to prevent the next pandemic for climate justice, for gender equity, for sustainable economic growth, to prevent zoonotic diseases, and to give solutions for NCDs. And he says, very important to walk the talk for climate justice, less, less, less trouble for reducing carbon footprint. Absolutely agree. And um, uh, so there's a question from Hugh, uh, who says, how soon can we incorporate planetary health charter into humanitarian accountability practices on the ground? So be accountable, not just to people, but I guess we have to also be accountable to the planet. Mm. You know, we're talking about uh, accountability to affected people. That's a big pet subject now with OCHA. Aren't we supposed to also be accountable to the planet. So this, these are some questions that are coming up. And then in the chat here, um, so maybe Marat, you can take the AAP question later. But Ben, uh, you mentioned how planetary health requires long-term commitment. How do we, as, human as a human species, exceptionally good at reacting and dealing with short-term needs, change our ways to be good ancestors, the role of faith-based and other values-based uh, motivations? So let's Let's start with those two first. Um, ben, maybe you can take on that one and then um, about just a little bit about accountability. Thanks. I, I think we do have to be realistic about how anticipatory and forward-looking humanitarians can be. Our, our incentives are to be responsive um, and that uh, over time we've slowly evolved and we've developed new functions to be more anticipatory, to, to, do, to build on resilience and so on. I guess for, for me, it's 
what planetary health lens does it gives us a wide angle lens and a, and a deep zoom lens on the problems we face um and it enables us to i think to you know generate i think we can apply it to make humanitarian work a little bit more anticipated. i'll give you an example of this but i think we can also use it to build stronger feedback loops between the symptoms and the causes of the planetary health crisis that's unfolding but we ourselves may not have the tools or the policy apparatus to actually deal with those. they they may be in the hands of other kinds of actors like longer term development actors and so on so i'll give you a very specific example of, of how taking a slightly longer term view has helped at using a kind of planetary health lens and it's um one of the initiatives that we've been investing in, in the uk humanitarian innovation hub is on the use of satellite technology to improve humanitarian crisis response and resilience and one of the most interesting and fascinating case studies relates to cholera now there's two different kind of perspectives on cholera and obviously many people many of the health specialists around the tech will know that, that you know there's the there's the the view of cholera that it occurs when there's certain levels of fecal matter in water systems and that's if you like a very narrow public health view of cholera but the environmental focus on cholera the environmental analysis is actually it's something that's endemic in the environment and it emerges when there's sufficient levels of rainfall sufficient density of rainfall um this these two ideas actually came together in yemen in 2017 where connecting scientific analysis that was done by nasa and other uh, meteorological organizations doing really sophisticated predictions of the risk of cholera based on early rainfall analysis where it has fallen where it's going to fall on a whole range of different factors actually not just not just um, rainfall but other other environmental factors as well they were able to predict and anticipate where cholera was going to take place in Yemen uh, to a much greater degree of precision than was previously the case and actually build it into a forecasting model. And that, that breakthrough meant that you didn't actually have to wait for cases of cholera to be detected before medical staff can take, start taking life-saving actions. The window, the early advanced window was anything between eight weeks to nine days before the cholera actually starts to hit. And what this meant was for humanitarians, humanitarians could, you know, they could start pre-positioning their work, they could start investing in a whole bunch of different, you know, uh, uh, hygiene kits and so on, rather than uh, start doing, um, I don't know what these high risk areas are. And, and, and to put those preventative and response measures in place where they're most needed, and that, that includes you know, essential supplies, and do it all in advance of the outbreak. And it did actually, in the Yemen case, where in 2017 it was the worst cholera outbreak in the world, taking a, a practical planetary health lens, an environmental lens, really did actually make a contribution to the diminishing of, of the, the, the outbreak there. And, and you saw an, an, an avoidance of the resurgence of cholera. So, I think we need to make sure that we are practical, we, we understand our limitations, but then we also use that knowledge. So we take that understanding and we use it to transform the way in which we deal with cholera globally, not just in Yemen. And we push public health actors and we push the World Health Organization to take that more environmental, that more holistic lens. So I, I think I think there's two, in, in two ways that we can be more anticipatory. And, and I think fundamentally it comes down to saying, you know, being, being fully humanitarian, being principled, doesn't just mean being principled for people that are suffering today. It means people being principled for the potential vulnerable uh, of the future and, and, and doing our best to offset that. And I think that we should, we should see that as part of our kind of core mission, really, from this point onwards. There's a couple of questions here on the chat. Richard. There's a couple of questions here on the chat, Richard. We can turn off your microphone and turn off your microphone and okay. So some questions in the chat quite relevant. Uh, Maria, uh, one of them, you know, Nan. Hi, Nan. It's nice to see you online. Uh, mentioned that at the Geneva Health uh, Forum, obviously there was a lot of discussions on One Health and planetary health. I know you were there, uh, very much uh, present and involved. And there's a question about, you no, know, are we? What's the difference, right, with One Health and how it's linked and also with the UNEP uh, work. 
Um, just for the person who asked that question, I've been engaging quite a bit with UNEP on this already. Of course, our center is very new, just to give a, a bit of a re reality check. We only set up in August and in the middle of COVID. Um, and then <clears throat> the question about One Health and, and Planetary Health. Uh, and also about um, MSF, you know, don't you move your organizational program to development if you want to tackle the environmental disasters and not only the impacts? <laughs> Yeah, well, <laughs> convince the world of, of the MSF on that, no. Um, <laughs> I mean, this, our modus operandi is humanitarian emergency work, and yeah. I think we have enough work to do um, because we're not actually fixing the problem. Yeah. And, um, and that's, if, if we are to fix the problem and we become irrelevant, great, then maybe there will be no need for MSF. Yeah. And that would be the goal, in fact. Unfortunately, that's not where we are today. Yeah. Um, and we will remain addressing the emergencies um, one after the other, and they're not stopping anytime soon. Yeah. And I mean, just to say that even if the humanitarian hotspots are existing today, those humanitarian hotspots are just going to get wider. As um, Ben had already said, it's going to be much broader. COVID has shown us a new era of fragility and vulnerability, and we opened programs here in Switzerland, in Italy, in the US, I opened it. it yeah. It's gonna be a new era for us. Okay. And so we all need to be working development and humanitarian actors alike. Um, on the One Health, Eco Health, Climate Change in Health, Environmental in Health, I mean, do something, follow something. But planetary health makes sense because of the centrality of the humans. It's where you put your focus and planetary health puts the humans at the center as both the cost and the, and the hopeful solution. And I think, you know, one of the great things about planetary health framing is that it highlights how the human systems are broken and how we need to fix it, whether that's the knowledge failures, the imagination failures or governance failures. And I think part of it is trying to understand that how we work together as the civiliz human civilization um, and protecting the planet Earth, which is our life system. And I think this is where the main, main crux of the differences are. It's where you put your focus. And I think it's time we took our responsibility. Well said, Maria. Uh, we have 15 minutes left. Questions from the floor. Thank you, please. Yeah. Maybe you identify yourself. Yeah. Nice to meet you. Um, a lot of organizations have signed up for the Charter for Environment and Climate Change, and so we can add more um, yeah. planetary health commitments to that. But I think in recent discussions, some people have said, this is great, we have the commitment that we can hold ourselves accountable to. And there's money there from some organizations. Yeah. Um, but for a lot of them, they don't have that ability to shift that much funding towards yeah. doing that. Yeah. Are you seeing shifts from donors in this direction to allow more of that on top of the existing work organizations to do? Is there any change? Any going to change? Is it more diverting funding for what we're Maria, do you think you can answer that? Maria and Ben, do you think you might want to um, comment on that? There is a, there is more money. Uh, well, more money. <laughs> I don't want to say it like that. There is money in climate change. Um, it's just where it needs to go. From the perspective of MSF, we are quite um, fortunate because the majority of our donors are private donors. So 95 to 96% of our funding um, is private. So the public is very much aware of the situation and they're very um, uh, giving on that note. COVID was probably one of the things that we were thinking we would drop. Um, but actually it increased, um, I think because of the realization that the future means we're going to be more fragile collectively. Yeah. And I think there's that interest to really go there and support. Um, it's no longer in that backyard, it's in our backyard. Yeah. Ben, any comments on that then, on funding? I think there are some donors that are more progressive than others in terms of funding climate change. I think one of the challenges for most donor organizations is, is the issue of silos. 
and this, that they also struggle to join up the dots uh, between these different issues. And I think it's become even harder in the wake of COVID where we're, we're doing so much you know, distributed learning and distributed working. Um, I, I, think the, I think we need to be looking at kind of bigger picture economic arguments for investing in these areas. You know, it reminds me a little bit of these, that, that, cut, that famous climate change cartoon where someone says, what, what, if, what if all it's all us and we build a better, better world for no reason? You know, and I think that the, the reality is, if you look at some of the monies that could have been invested early on in the COVID response in preventing the spread, the, the, the figure that I was, uh, the figure that I, I was aware of in January 2020 was it, it could have cost somewhere between 20, 20 to 45 billion to stop COVID right then. And that was figure that, that was seen as unpalatably high for the governments of the world. Whereas today, you know, if you were to tell them today, 45 billion in 2020 would have stopped the chaos and the havoc and the drama of the last two years. I think they would have bitten your arm off. So I think it's actually contingent on us to work better to frame these issues in ways which donor governments actually can move up the political agenda. And this actually means that another angle, a kind of economic angle on what we're doing, and I think it's happening to some extent in some areas, disaster risk reduction is often talked about, you know, a stitch in time saves nine. We know about the cost of the value added of resilience being one of, and food security resilience being one of the highest value for money investments we can make. I think we need to start to be seeing these same kinds of messages coming through from for planetary health you know what what does it take to invest in better cholera prevention what does a global forecasting tool actually look like that takes into account environmental factors why aren't we investing in it and actually put the foot on the other boot as it were um, in general i think that there, there are enough enough progressive donors that if we can if we can make the case in compelling ways the money can be made available I think what we're what we're lacking is the imagination and the evidence. that neighborhood I use it a lot when I'm dealing with the private sector and the government but it was research uh, in science 2020 Dr. et al where the cost of preventing the next pandemic was just two percent of the COVID-19 bill uh, and that was 260 billion estimated spending needed over the next 10 years to prevent a future pandemic uh, against a total estimated economic damage from COVID-19 in 2020 of 11.5 trillion so I think that evidence base generating that and the convincing narrative, but I, you know, many people know me as the, the, the um, I'm a persistent optimist, right? So I think that COVID-19 is different because everyone experienced it. I think if it was Ebola or any other outbreak, there were only certain parts of the world that were affected. But I just feel that this is the right time because every one of us was affected in some way or other. Um, and I think, you know, this is why we need to capitalize on that 
memory that we have uh, to try and engage. And I think that, you know, coming to financing, there was also a question about donors. Um, just to tell you a little bit about our center, it's in Malaysia, little country. Uh, it's in the university. It's a private university with a philanthropist, uh, uh, you know, who founded it. Um, it has a Jeff Sachs Center for Sustainable Development in it. Um, but the university, why I went to university, because I thought that the only way I could be a good ancestor was to have that long-term thinking. And the way to do it was through education. And uh, the university uh, from 2024, so we're now piloting all the modules on planetary health, but from 2024, every student who enrolls in the university, whether for engineering or communications or culinary, science, culinary arts, will have to do a mandatory course in planetary health. Uh, therefore, we hope when they become corporate leaders, when they become civil servants, when they become entrepreneurs, they actually keep that lens uh, in front of them and their impact and the impact of the work they do and their businesses that they set up on the planet and on health. And um, so that was the sort of long-term ambitious goal because I think it will be not my generation, but the next generation of humanitarian leaders that have to grapple. Already we are grappling, but they will have a worse off situation. And perhaps that new generation of ERCs and donors uh, and all these important people and political leadership uh, that will actually start to invest in this. And I think um, for us, uh, even at a university level, uh, you know, every bit of research that gen is generated from any of the schools has to be linked to planetary health. So that's the, the very ambitious and, you know, um, you know, obviously we got our narrative right with the president, but, you know, who believes that, yes, that's the way forward because this is going to be a university for the future, uh, you know, to prevent that. Uh, are there any other questions from the floor? If none, we have a little qu uh, question to ask you. The last one, I think, yeah. Hmm? No, we don't? <laughs> that's what we do. A show of hands, yeah. So I think the first thing is that how many of you think, and for those online, please you know, put a thumbs up or whatever. Um, how many of you think that we should request the IAC to let us work up some policy thinking on the planetary health humanitarian interface? Almost the entire room. Uh, and I hope online. And who in this room might be interested to join us uh, on a working group? Fantastic. And we'll be in touch. And uh, I was going to ask, should we ask the organizers to consider re renaming the Climate Change and Environment AOCC to Planetary Health Crisis AOCC? <laughs> but I think Mervat already sort of very gently told me that I'm being too ambitious. No, 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 no. It's just yeah, yeah. The so. <laughs> yeah. So, so which leaves me, you know, first of all, to thank all of you for being here, for being engaged. Um, for great questions, you know, Ambassador Faisal, thank you so much for being here. I know that it's difficult for you today, but thank you for being here with us virtually. And Ben as well, uh, Mervat for taking time out. I know how busy you are and Maria, but most of all, everyone who's been here. Um, as I mentioned again, we are brand new, but let me tell my personal journey in planetary health. Malaysia, I hope there are no, no one's going to take offense with what I'm going to say. Malaysia has always been very grateful that we are surrounded by Indonesia and Philippines because we were a peninsula that was kind of protected. So the earthquakes would happen in Indonesia and Philippines and the cyclones would happen in Philippines and Indonesia. We were kind of, okay, we have a little bit of rain. Over the last two years, I would say, we have been hit badly. Uh, by the impact of climate change and never before you know have we experienced so much flooding loss of lives loss of property loss of everything right and that made people furious and for the first time you know we see people really going to social media and saying they've had enough that you know we can't deal with these floods anymore you know and I keep telling them can you imagine how our friends in Indonesia and Philippines felt every year but they've had the advantage of learning so the timing of the Planetary Health Centre in a way was important because we could then convince the government that we need to find some solutions now. And, um, you know, where we have been able, fortunately, to actually convince them to be able to put planetary health into the development budget uh, and for the next five years as an area that we have to look at, that everything we do also has to have a link to planetary health. 
but more importantly now to have a planetary health roadmap and a framework. Uh, and I think that you know, if Malaysia can do it, anyone can. I think you have to be convinced that this is important. For me, in my twilight years in the humanitarian sector, you know, I'm convinced with Roman's book that we all have to be good ancestors. So with that, thank you so much for being here. Please stay in touch with us. I know, um, uh, and uh, thank you again for, for being us. And please stay safe and have a wonderful HNPW. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.